Is church membership biblical? That's a question that has come up in conversation a few times over the last couple of weeks, and you can understand why that would be the case. We are preaching through Acts, and so as we study a book such as Acts, we're talking about the local church. We're talking about the church in Jerusalem. We're talking about how they gather together, the events that led uh, to Pentecost. Of course, Jesus has promised to send the Holy Spirit. And, uh, and then uh, we see the empowerment of the local church. We see the church growing. We see the church serving one another. We find the church going out as witnesses of the resurrection. And so we're going to spend a lot of time talking about that. Um, when you think about what we're preaching through, and then you understand that right now we're looking at... Uh, having two membership classes. So we, we've already had one. We have a second one coming up, and we have a baptism Sunday on March 5th. So when you when you start looking at that and seeing that we have qualifications to be a member of the church, and we understand in, in our church that uh, to be a member conveys some unique opportunities of service that otherwise uh, people are not uh, enabled to participate in. When people begin to evaluate those sort of things, uh, sometimes we read through scripture and somebody might say, well, the word membership doesn't appear. Sure, it says we are members of one another or of one body, but, but we don't find this sort of same membership. We don't find classes leading to people being uh, recognized as members in a local church. So what is this all about? When we approach a topic like this, I want us to be sensitive to the fact that within a church family such as ours, there might be some differing views on, on this topic. And, uh, and so as I approach it, I, I seek to approach it with humility and graciousness. My goal is not to bash anybody over the head, but instead to convey uh, what has long been uh, beliefs and practices uh, within Baptist churches and uh, certainly values and practices that we have maintained as the First Baptist Church of Lyonsville. So, as I was thinking through this, and again, this has come up in conversations with a few with a few different Christians. It's come up um, in a number of different ways, and some of those have been full conversations. Others have been, you know, kind of kick the can down the road conversations where I say, you know, we'll, we'll chat more about this later down the road, and I, I hope we can have those because I love hearing uh, people's opinions on this. Um, this is not the hill upon which our salvation is crowded, and so I have uh, brothers and sisters in Christ with whom uh, I may disagree on this topic, but I do want to just take time to address it because I do think it's relevant, especially because we offer membership classes. And uh, and so as I was thinking through this and praying through it, I, I went ahead and scanned the internet a little bit and, and read some of the common objections to uh, church membership. Of course, the first one that you're going to hear is that the word membership, uh, church membership, does not appear uh, in the New Testament. And that is certainly true. I, I concede that point. Um, the position that I'm going to maintain is that um, the qualifications for membership and uh, all of the framework of it are present in the New Testament. So whether we call it by that term or we use another term, to me, uh, I'm, I'm rather indifferent on, on how we define it or what we term it, but I think that there is a general structure or framework that most believers will agree with. And of course, when you start talking about membership not being a word or a term that's found in Scripture, then all of a sudden the idea that there would be a membership kind of qualification or that there would be classes that correspond with it, then it is perceived that these are extra biblical, that, that we are adding extra steps that would hinder people from coming to faith or, or to walk in obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ. And we certainly don't desire that. And uh, and so when people approach this subject from that vantage point, um, <clears throat> I, I really appreciate their heart in that there's a sincere desire to obey the Lord, to encourage as many people as possible to walk in obedience to him. And, and so I, I certainly respect um, the, the heart attitude there. Uh, there have certainly been um, unhealthy concepts of the church as well as of um, membership. And so to give a few, some have, uh, as I was looking at the across the internet, some have uh, addressed um, or identified complaints such as, you know, there's extra biblical or unbiblical requirements to being a member of a local church. An example of that might be um, some 
limiting factors such as uh, clothing attire or maybe gray subject issues where there are issues of, of conscience, of, of Christian uh, liberty. And so we have an opportunity to disagree with one another in Christ. Uh, we can say, well, in my liberty, I can do this. And, and we have the whole weaker brother argument. And uh, and instead of approaching it with in in those sort of terms, sometimes churches can try to just be very clear. This is the position that we maintain, and you will maintain this, or you will not be a member of this church. Now, if it was just if it were just a value of we, this is what we believe, and generally this is the normative practice in the church. That's one thing. But sometimes churches go overboard in their wording on that, and so I understand the pushback on that. Um, some have perceived an exclusive status that is that is given, that you know you can only serve in certain capacities if you are a member, and you only have some privileges afforded to you if you are a member. And I'm going to speak more to that one as we go through this. Um, and of course, another complaint or concern, criticism, however you want to frame it, would be that there are these classes that are offered. Typically, when we find churches that do have church membership, they also have classes. And so, again, the perception is that this is extra biblical. There is no reason uh, we don't find Paul or Peter sitting down and walking people through several classes and trying to uh, make them go through a specific process in order to become members of the local church. And so those are complaints that are, are frequently offered. I was reading through different complaints, and one that I saw was this objection that, you know, there's no there's no qualifications to being a member of a local church or a part of a local church. One doesn't even need to be a follower of Jesus. I, I think that's a gross misunderstanding, um, and, and I think that probably the people I've discussed this topic with would push back to that as well, uh, even if they don't agree with the term. Membership would say there, there are certainly some qualifications to being part of a local church. And so... The, the position that I'm going to maintain is that while the, while the, while the uh, term church membership does not appear in Scripture, the framework of what we describe as membership is. And so I'm going to speak to that framework. Um, when I talk about church membership, I mean a few things. One, when we look at the New Testament, we find that only Followers of Jesus Christ are part of the true church. These are people who have, who have responded in saving faith to the gospel message. Only they are part of the true church. Now, we cannot fully discern who is and who is not because we can't see people's hearts. We can only see the fruit and we can hear the profession of one's mouth. But I want us to understand that the expectation is that only those who have responded in saving faith to the gospel message, those who have the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, are a part of the local church. The second is that the church glorifies Jesus Christ by building itself up, by equipping members to use their gifts to glory, to glorify Jesus, to encourage one another, to, uh, to come along and support people and help them use their spiritual gifts. It also exists to partner together to reach the lost, again, for the glorification of Jesus Christ. We find in the New Testament that there are qualifi qualifications to being a part of the body. And so those qualifications include uh, striving for holiness. Uh, we find in 1 Corinthians 5 that, that when there's a man who's living in gross sexual immorality, that he is to be removed from the body. They ought to maintain sound doctrine. Uh, when the Apostle Paul writes about people who come in and they offer these false teaching, the implication is that they are not one of us. They are not to be a part. Uh, in Acts chapter 20, when Paul warns the the Ephesian elders. He warns them to, to safeguard the flock against the wolves who are going to come in. The, the goal is to not allow them to enter in and certainly not to allow them to teach, which means that there is a there is an understanding of what sound doctrine is. There is an expectation that doctrine will be conveyed in an appropriate way, and there is an expectation that those who do not align with that doctrine are not going to be part of the body. Now, again, when we start looking at doctrine, uh, we're talking about core beliefs within the church, uh, beliefs that every single member should align and agree with. Uh, we're not talking about minor details. We're not talking about 
what I would term secondary theological concerns or um, passages that um, may be confusing, conflicting. Uh, we're talking about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We're talking about the Bible being the final authority for faith and practice. We're talking about how the Holy Spirit should, uh, how if we are in Christ, then we should be sanctified. We should be growing in holiness. Uh, doctrines along those lines. Uh, the third, uh, one ought to be striving for unity. If, if we are, for instance, um, observing the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner, people are just eating whenever they want, or they are, they are spreading gossip behind people's backs, they are being divisive, uh, this is not becoming of those who would be part of the body of Christ. Uh, the fourth would be using gifts appropriately. The expectation is that because we are part of the of one body, we do not malign people who have different spiritual gifts than us. We do not elevate anybody on a pedestal. So there are expectations and people are called to conform to these, to use their gifts to build up the body, to encourage one another, not to cause division, not to sidetrack the mission, but instead to partner together to fulfill the mission for which Jesus has called his church. And so, so far, uh, there is an expectation that those who would be part of the true church would be saved, that um, the church exists for a specific purpose, that there are qualifications to being part of the local church. Uh, we also find um, <clears throat> that uh, there, there is an act that, that indicates that we believe uh, the, the proper things, that we uh, do identify with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. What is that? Well, that's baptism. Uh, in the New Testament, we find that people respond in saving faith to the gospel message, and then they go down into the water in identification with the death of Jesus, death and burial. They come out of it as a picture of the resurrection. We find this in Romans chapter 6, explicitly stated. And so this is what we find in Pentecost, for instance. We find that 3,000 people were added to the church that day. And again, they expect they are being added to something. They become a part of the body or of the family. They become a part of something, something that has qualifications, something that require them to identify with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. There are expectations of how they will behave within that assembly of other believers. There is also um, expectations. There are expectations that you will serve one another, uh, not just a qualification, but an expectation. If you're going to be part of the body, you are going to use the gifts that God has given you. The idea uh, in the New Testament that um, somebody would join a church family, they would be joining a social club, they would never use their gifts, they would not encourage other believers, they wouldn't pray together, and they wouldn't partner together to share the gospel. This is novel, uh, this would be new, this would be something that you would never find in the New Testament. There are expectations. There's an expectation that we'll be growing together in holiness. Um, and then there's accountability. So not only do people believe that they're entering into a into a church body, they are being part of something in the New Testament, but they can also be removed from that. Um, Jesus told the disciples that, you know, if, if they catch a brother in sin, they're to go to them privately. You know, we're not supposed to air this out on social media and share it as a prayer request. Uh, we're supposed to go to that person one-on-one. -on -one. And then if, if they don't repent of that sin, what do we do? We take witnesses with us. And then if they don't, what do we do? That will be removed from the body. By the way, that passage where two or three are gathered in my name, it's not about prayer. It's actually about church discipline. It's about having the authority that Jesus gives to the church to remove somebody from the body. And, and so this is what we see as the framework. And uh, we could probably expand on that and add details to it. But, but I trust that all believers, even if we disagreed about whether or not we use the term membership, we would agree with this. To be a part of the body, a contributing part, uh, you need to be saved. You need to know Jesus as your Savior. This does not mean that unbelievers are excluded from gathering together. Um, it just means that they are not part of the true church. Um, this does not mean um, that, uh, that people should be treated differently. I, I saw one concern that um, <clears throat> when you become a member, you join this exclusive club. And it's only then, uh, because you're giving a certain amount that the church is tracking or whatever it might be, that uh, only then will the pastoral staff care about you. Will they meet with you and pray with you and disciple you? And that should never happen. Um, I, I hope that that doesn't happen. 
it probably does somewhere, but uh, but it doesn't happen here. Uh, the desire is that we would come alongside people and encourage and disciple and disciple them. But but we do understand this general framework. Again, people need to be saved to be part of the of the body, to be part of the family of God. Uh, second, uh, that uh, this church exists for a purpose. Uh, the third is that there are qualifications to being part of the body. The fourth is that there are expectations. And the fifth is that there 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 can be somebody somebody can be removed from that body. Again, heaven forbid somebody ever is removed through church discipline. The goal is to restore them. The goal is not simply to shame, to dismiss, to kick somebody out. It's to restore them in the faith. And so, those are the values that we find. So with that framework, um, I want us to, to consider here this idea of membership classes now. And I want us to think about within that framework what this, what this looks like. So we find a few principles that I think are very helpful for us as we think about membership classes. Um, uh, the first is that there is a vetting process for, for those who serve. In the New Testament, there is an exclusive quality here. This does not mean that people are perceived as being better or greater than or more spiritual. It's that there has to be an assessment to know who is qualified to teach, who is qualified to use their gifts in certain capacities. Uh, Paul is very clear that that when it comes to teachers, especially that the people examine their conduct. People also examine. Their doctrine, what they say, uh, we find in First uh, in Titus chapter one, th these very principles. And so there's this idea that that their works, their words, they are going to be examined. Well, how do we examine those things? If, for instance, anybody can just come in, anybody can teach anything, nobody establishes any standard whatsoever. We can't even agree uh, what sort of doctrine we profess to be accurate and true and worthy of being taught from the church. And so anybody comes in and teaches, well, how do you begin to qualify uh, whether somebody is a, is a sound teacher, whether they are a false teacher? And so there, there are some exclusive, uh, there is some exclusive exclusivity to that principle uh, because we are, we are trying to recognize who is teaching what is true. And I believe that should be true of exercising all spiritual gifts. Um, you do not want to uh, put people spiritually in harm. We understand in our day and age that there has been a lot of spiritual abuse, domineering people who come in who are really, um, they're predators, uh, spiritual predators, and they're seeking to puff themselves up. Well, we need to be able to identify that and to quantify it uh, so that we can speak out against it, so we can keep people out of certain position so that they can't do that which is sinful. Now, they repent of that. If they're growing, then we want to plug them into opportunities where they can serve and use their gifts. But but how do you how do you begin to address what is pure doctrine? Who is qualified to teach or who is qualified to use their gifting? I trust that believers in every church would agree that to some degree these activities should occur. Um, somebody might ask the question, well, why don't we find classes like this explaining what sound doctrine is, what the expectations for Christians are? Why don't we find this in the New Testament? And this is a great question. I want us to go back to Pentecost. What does Peter do in his sermon? Does he just look forward or does he look back first? Well, he looks backwards. He's speaking to Jewish people who understand a lot about God. They understand the Old Testament. They understand what it means to be a covenant people. They understand the obligations that they have to one another as well as to the unbelieving world. And so to that audience, then Peter begins to build upon that. And he says, well, Jesus has fulfilled prophecy. The, he has risen from the dead. And so he explains these things. And then people respond. They say, well, what do we have to do to be saved? And he tells them they need to repent. And he tells them that they need to be baptized. And so we find that they, they repent of their sins. They believe on, on the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. They turn away from their sins. They turn unto him. And then indicating the fact that they identify with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, they are baptized, which means that Peter had to explain what is Christian baptism, what, what is taking place here. So Peter does explain for them. He takes the time to explain to them, this is what Christians believe. This is what Christians do. And then they follow through in that. Now, however long that process looks, how formal it is, 
that framework is there. Uh, what is it that Christians believe? What is it that we're supposed to do? And that's pretty much as simplistic as, as one needs to make it. We find this throughout the New Testament, that when people come to saving faith in Jesus, that, that so often there's teaching that is going along with that. There's an ongoing dialogue, perhaps, uh, with uh, Philip or with Paul, um, with Peter, with John. And then people become part of a body, and then they are instructed on what they ought to do within that body. And so, so these sort of values are there. Well, why do I think then it's important to have, say, classes, formal classes? Well, I think that there's a few, few reasons for this. Um, the first is that um, <coughs> if, if it is important that people, um, if it's important that people understand that there is sound doctrine, there is something that really that Christians should believe. We should agree that, that Jesus died for our sins, that he was that he was sealed in a tomb, that, that on the third day he rose from the dead. If, if we're going to have a, a standard uh, or a, a standard of teaching, a body of teaching that, that is our final authority for faith and practice, if there is a standard that we will maintain, and then it's important that people know what that is. It's important that people know coming into the church that if I'm going to be part of this body, whether you use the term member or not, what do they believe? Well, somebody should have the opportunity to hear that. And of course, throughout the weekly sermons, we, we do hear that, but it's stretched out over a long period of time, of course. We're explaining scripture, um, and so we're going passage by passage. Um, when we talk about qualifications, we say, well, there are qualifications to being a member. Um, one needs to, we find in the New Testament, that when people are added to the body of Christ, what, what do they do? Well, they, they are baptized first. They go down in identification, again, with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. They do profess that they are followers of Jesus Christ. They do commit to being uh, contributing parts of the body. They do strive for holiness together. They do have a desire to fulfill the mission for which Jesus has called the church. Well, if we don't take time to explain those expectations to people, then we're just saying, well, you're part of this and you're supposed to do all these things, but we're not going to tell you what they are up front. You're going to figure it out as we go along. The third is, um, is this reality that if you do not live in a way that brings glory to Jesus. If you are morally compromised, uh, your testimony is compromised because of ongoing habitual sin, that you will be removed from the body. If we just tell people that, they might have no concept of what that means. In, in the, uh, especially in the early parts of the New Testament, as we find the church really being empowered and, and launching, this, this, this group who are gathered together at Pentecost, they know the law. They know what God desires, what he deems to be holy, and what he, what he finds to be abhorrent. They, they, they know these things. Uh, we live in a culture that, in which there are many people who have no understanding of what, what we mean when we say sin, when we describe habitual sin, when we talk about things that are not pleasing to God. So they have no concept of these things. And then if we just walk them in off the body and we say, we're never going to explain to them what that, this is. We're never going to talk to them about that accountability structure that exists. Instead, one day we're just going to come up and say, hey, what you're doing is wrong and you're no longer part of this. And you can see how that would create a, a lot of pushback and confusion. Um, and so what do we do in our membership classes? How do we kind of, kind of begin to land this ship? Our membership classes are just two parts. The first part we explain who we are as a church family, where we came from. You're joining this, this body. What has happened historically here? What, what's going on here? What are, what are the sort of values that we have? Um, there's lots of churches in our community. There's lots of great churches and great ministers and uh, people in these church families who would love you and, uh, and love Jesus and are desiring to fulfill the mission for which he has called his church. I don't have any doubt about that. So, But each one of these is a little bit unique. And so you, with your background experiences, your unique doctrinal convictions, you might best align with, with us, with another congregation, and that's okay. It's okay. 
And so, but we do want to be upfront and say, these are the values that we've maintained. This is sort of the, the values that we have had. And this is the way that we have sought to fulfill the Great Commission. And maybe the Lord is calling you here because there's going to be a part of that that you can contribute, or maybe the Lord will help to lead us even in a new direction. Uh, but we want to be very upfront about what we have done, what we are doing as we try to bring honor and glory to Jesus. And so we try to do that. We explain our doctrine statement. This is what we believe. This is what we believe every Christian should believe. And you can find our doctrine statement on our website. Um, I think it's very straightforward. It doesn't beat around the bush. It doesn't wade off into secondary doctrinal matters. Uh, it's one that I believe all Christians should agree with, regardless of uh, theological uh, tradition. And so uh, as, as a Christian, so whether you were Pentecostal or Methodist or Baptist, these are things that, that we can be in agreement with, um, or any other denomination, not to exclude anybody. I just don't have time in this video to list like hundreds of denominations or faith traditions. But um, um, so so that's that's some of what we do. Then we explain the operation of the, the church because this is where it starts to get confusing for people. So how are decisions made? How are finances spent? How are resources being stewarded over? Um, excuse me, how do we how do we seek to fulfill the Great Commission? And so we try to answer these sort of questions for people. In the second class, we get into baptism. What, what is baptism all about? Um, the diaconate board comes, they hear our testimonies. Does somebody really believe the gospel message? When, when Peter preached it the day of Pentecost, the people responded in saving faith. Immediately, he knew that they responded to the gospel message because he was there. And so they're immediately baptized. But if you're not there when somebody uh, was saved, the question might be, well, what do you know? Somebody might say, well, as long as they say they had some Christian experience, that should be good enough for you. But even Paul doesn't do that. Remember when he meets uh, Priscilla and Aquila and he asks them about the about the Holy Spirit and and he and they say, well, we, we don't know anything about the Holy Spirit. And so then he has to clarify for them before they're added to the fold. Well, that's just the same thing that we're doing. We're just making sure that everybody uh, has had a, a genuine conversion experience that they do want to identify with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and that they agree with the doctrine of the church and they desire to be contributing members. Because again, there are expectations in the New Testament of, of those who are part of a local church, whether we use the term part, member, um, whatever terminology we use. And so we just explain those. There's nothing there that's added that's, that's extra. Um, it's just being fair to people and helping them understand sort of what we are doing is we try to fulfill the, the Great Commission and try to build up the body in love and faithful service. And so when we look at these sort of, of things, I, I, I am sensitive to the fact that people have had um, diverse experiences in churches. And I know that sometimes people have um, added extra biblical or unbiblical uh, sort of qualifications, and, and we should push back against those. But when we're talking about looking at the framework of the New Testament, that you're going to be a follower of Jesus, that you responded in saving faith to the gospel message, that in obedience you were baptized um, after responding in saving faith to the gospel, that there are qualifications to being part of the body, that there are expectations, that there's accountability. If we agree with that framework, then it makes sense that we would explain that framework to somebody who would be new coming into our body, especially because there are so many people in our culture who are first-generation Christians. There are so many people who come from diverse backgrounds. There's a lot of false teaching out there that's prevalent in our culture. And so we, we want to clarify things for people because we want to be helpful. And we really want to make sure that the church operates in a way that brings the Lord the most glory and that leads to uh, believers being discipled. And so these are values that we maintain. If you have any questions about that, um, concerns, please do reach out to me. Um, I just really seek uh, to encourage you to be a healthy, contributing part of the body. We belong to one another. You are necessary. You are a necessary part of the body. God has given you gifts uh, that you are to exercise, um, and they're needed. And so I, I just want to encourage you in that uh, God is doing some exciting things, and I really look forward in the upcoming weeks to continuing to talk about the local church. May the Lord bless you.